Hello, and welcome to the Cattle Show. My name's Kurt Ruppel, Dairy Specialist with Cargill Animal Nutrition. Did you know, in a glass of milk, over two-thirds of the amino acids in that milk originated from some bacteria or microbe growing inside a cow's rumen? Today's show is going to focus on forage quality. That's how that rumen can grow those microbes. And what we're going to do is talk about forage quality, define it, what it is to a cow, what it takes to produce it, how we're going to monitor it, and what it means economically to you as a producer. So what is forage quality? What's forage quality to a cow? Forage quality means that a cow can eat a lot of it and she can get a lot out of the plant. Forage is made up of individual cells. Those cells have cell walls and cell contents, what's inside the cell. The cell walls are made up of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. That's the part that's unique to a ruminant animal. She carries microbes that can break down those bonds and actually produce sugar from that cell wall. The more that she can do that, the more that forage allows her to do that, the higher the quality of the forage is. So that's one aspect of forage quality. It's the NDF, or that cell wall digestibility. The other aspect is the percent of that whole plant that is cell wall which also defines how much is cell content. Cell contents are sugar, rapidly available carbohydrates. That's going to be instantly available to that rumen to grow microbes. The cell wall is going to be more slowly available. So the percentage of the two, cell wall to cell content is important, and the digestibility or how fast that cell wall can be broken apart inside that rumen is another aspect of forage quality that's important. So how do we define forage quality? NDF digestibility. That's the part that tells you how fast that cell wall can be broken apart. And percent NDF, how, what percentage that cell wall is of the total plant. Two major aspects of forage quality. So now that we know what forage quality is a little bit, how do we as managers produce forage that has that higher forage quality? One key aspect when we're producing haylage is to know when to go in and cut that crop. Timing is everything. As that plant matures in the field, the percent NDF goes up and the digestibility of that NDF goes down. So we need signals to know when to go in and cut that plant and stop it from progressing and put it into a silo to preserve those nutrients. Those signals include for alfalfa, monitoring growing degree days. When we get first cutting alfalfa, it kind of sets the whole season into, into motion. If we monitor growing degrees, we know when the optimum NDF content is, about 40% NDF. We go in and make that first cutting, and then we time it off of that every 28 to 32 days. If it's grass, we need to look at the morphology of the plant. Where's that head in relation to coming out of the plant? If that head is still inside that, the shoot, then it's ready to go. And we balance that with the amount of uh, tonnage that's there. So timing is everything in terms of getting that high quality forage. The other aspect with haylage is to get it wilted down to the right dry matter because that's going to determine the type of fermentation that occurs in the silo. And it's the nutrients that we preserve through ensiling is what's going to actually get to the cow. So we've defined forage quality. We've learned a little bit of how to manage for forage quality. What's it mean economically to a producer? Well, to a dairy producer, if we look at high quality forage versus low quality forage versus very low quality forage, we could be talking about a 35 cent per cow per day difference between the high and the low and 35 between the low and the very low. So economically, that's a huge paycheck for having high quality forage. For beef producers, having high quality forage in front of their cows is going to get you more beef per ton of forage. So the benefit of having high quality forage in front of a cow is that she can eat more of it and still have a high level of production and that's going to eliminate some of the nutrients coming from purchased concentrates. So economically we're much more efficient and health-wise the cow is much more efficient if she has high quality forages and lots of them in their diet. So normal dry matter intake on a high producing dairy cow is going to be some 50, almost 60 pounds of dry matter intake. If we can produce a diet that's over 50 percent forage it's a much better economic picture than if we have to have more concentrate in there. And likewise, the health of that animal is going to be more productive throughout her lifetime.
One way to visualize it is that a dairy cow's rumen only has the capacity to hold so much cell wall. Cell wall, again, is NDF, or neutral detergent fiber. And that amount of NDF that a rumen can hold is about 1% of her body weight. So for example, if we have a 1,300 pound cow, 1% 1 of that is 13 pounds. If we've got a forage that's 50% NDF, that means that she can only hold 26 pounds of forage. If instead that forage is 40% NDF, she can hold 16 pounds. So that means a higher percentage of her diet can come from the forage side. That's more economic firepower. If you think about a forage plant, its purpose in life is to produce a seed. So the longer it's allowed to mature, the harder and more cell wall is in here to develop in order so to hold that seed coat up, that seed up. So the longer it stays in the field, the more cell wall develops. We harvest alfalfa or grass at a very immature stage because we want to get it before it produces seed. A plant's purpose in life is to produce a seed and produce a next generation. The longer you let it out here, the closer it gets to seed, the more lignin and cellulose and hemicellulose, the NDF, the higher percentage that is of the plant, plus those cell wall components are held more tightly together over time. So we need to get at that plant before that happens and still balance out the amount of tonnage that's out there for us. There's a lot we can talk about in terms of forage quality. There's a lot of nutrients that we measure. In my mind, the most important ones are the NDF, the neutral detergent fiber, the cell wall, what percentage that is of the plant and how digestible it is. Everything else kind of flows from that because if the cow can eat more of that forage, and get more out of it, she's gonna grow more rumen microbes and, and produce protein that way. So crude protein, yeah, it's good to look at, but it's not the key critical factor. The key critical factor is the amount of NDF and the digestibility NDF. Later, as we're going to ensile this crop, another key critical factor is what dry matter is it going into the silo? Because that's gonna determine the type of fermentation that occurs and that's going to determine how many nutrients we get out of it when it comes out of the silo. We're with Mark Stanton, Stanton Farms, and Mark is in the middle of constructing a new bunker silo complex, feeding complex up here. So Mark, uh, why don't you tell the folks about why you constructed this new facility for storing all your forages, and then we'll get in later about uh, how it's constructed. Through the uh, CAFO laws that have come into play in the last few years, we determined, or through working through NRCS, and that our existing bunker silos don't meet the standards as far as having a filtration area. And as being an expanding farm, we felt in our best interest to, instead of trying to remodel that area down there to move up here to this, you know, make a new facility up here. And I think we're on the right track with it. Now, if it wasn't for these regulations, would you have you'd put the investment into building this facility where it is now? Well, we were kind of in a unique situation. We constructed a lot of homemade bunker silos about 15 years ago, and they, they were showing a lot of deterioration. And I think probably we would have maybe made the move up here just so we are makes ourselves more efficient this way especially you know since we're going to be an expanded farm and we've grown from 60 cows in 1990 up to our current size of 360. All right. All right. So you have a lot of smaller silos here and what's that going to enable you to do as far as your storage strategy? Well what we're hoping to do is take all of our cuttings of haylage and put them in separate bunks so our, our goal is to probably have enough for three, three to four cuttings of haylage, two bunker silos for corn silage, and then maybe another silo just to put into the rotation to have one empty all the time. Why don't you show me some of the construction you've been doing? Sure. So Mark, tell me about this wall construction. Uh, these are prefab walls that we had brought in from Canada. They're 12 foot high, about six foot long, and they're set on a grade. We kind of preferred the 12 foot high walls because we felt that we could store more material, be less width in the bunk. We thought we could take care of the face better. So 12 foot high, you're never going to put anything in here that would require going over the wall, right? Well, I will never say that. Oh, I think, come on. <laughs> I would say, you know, we probably do that already. Uh, we like to 
hopefully we'd like to round up the top so we'd have better drainage off the sides and stuff like that to control some of the water and uh, so we don't have as much uh, spoilage on the sides. But using a 12 foot wall, is, you're more likely to stay within that wall than if you had 8 foot walls, 10 oh, absolutely. foot walls in here. Oh absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So Mark, uh, you've had, you have a few options with flooring here and you've chosen to go asphalt. Tell me uh, what went into that decision and, and what you had to do as a result of that decision. Uh, first off, as far as the asphalt goes, uh, we really seem to like that type of system because in the past our existing bunker silos, they had concrete. It seemed like the silage acid really deteriorated that concrete and we did some asphalt back in 1998 and it's held up very well. So we decided on all this new construction to use asphalt. Tell me about how it sloped to, to handle effluent and runoff and, uh, and then how the, this whole construction is going to handle uh, runoff water because that's a key objective here to mm -hmm. to this whole facility is to handle that that aspect of it. Right. We uh, we like to you know certainly keep the dirty water and the clean water uh, part. Uh, floors are constructed on a one percent slope. Uh, this area out in front of us here will eventually be all concrete. Uh, it will be like a parabolic channel to take the dirty water and, and take it to the filtration area. So. In the end, you're going to be able to take the dirty water from here and the clean water from, from the hillside and, and channel those separately into a filtration and storage area. That's right. And plus, they'll also have what they call a low flow storage tank. So this silage leachate that will drain into this tank, we can uh, pump that out and then spread it on fields so it's taken up by the crops. So you're going to capture that, those nutrients that are normally an environmental hazard and wasted, and you're going to be recycling them back through the crop system. Right. Great. What are the factors that determine forage quality? One key critical one is timing. When we get in there early, we're going to get that NDF before it becomes hard and solidified and, and more, more hard for that cow to digest. And the other is that we're going to have less of it. Another key critical factor is the environment. The amount of heat, the amount of moisture is going to do a large part to determine how that NDF is put together. If we have cool weather and wet weather, the lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose are more tightly bound together. So if we have that type of growing season, we're going to have inherently lower NDF digestibility. So how do we monitor forage quality? The most important thing to do is to get an accurate sample. When we put forage into a silo, it comes from a bunch of different fields and a bunch of little different microenvironments form in that silo. If we take one spot here or one spot there, we could have vastly different profiles coming out of that silo. So we need to get a large sample and a representative sample of that entire face that's being used to feed that animal. To get an accurate sample, we need to sample across the whole face of a bunker silo. And instead of walking right up to that silo and trying to take a bunch of different samples, it's much safer and much more accurate to get the unloader to come in, whether it's a defacer or it's a, a bucket loader, come in and get that sample as they would normally get a load of silage. And then take that material away from the silo, subsample that and analyze it, or run it through a mixer wagon that doesn't have other ingredients in it and sample as that's coming out of the mixer wagon. That's going to give us our most accurate samples that we can determine nutrients from. Once we get an accurate sample of the forage that we're going to be feeding, we need to send it to a reliable lab. And a lab that will do a good job in turning around the results to us in a timely manner so we can make the changes before it's too late and before other things start happening on the farm. And the other is the fact that we need nutrients that we're actually going to use in our formulation. Cargill Animal Nutrition has worked very hard in, in the last few years to produce a forage lab that's tightly linked with its formulation system. So when we're measuring NDF in our Elk River Forage Lab, it's the NDF that our max formulation system is expecting to see. If we're working with other labs, they have slightly different ways of measuring NDF, and so we're not getting an accurate analysis of that plant. So once we get that type of analysis turned back to us, then when we're formulating a diet, we can account for that in what we put with that forage and make a complete diet for that cow. So how do we manage risk with forages? Well, there's the risk of not having enough forage, which is probably the most devastating. 
And that can happen many ways through growing season, environment, mistakes in applying pesticides, et cetera, et cetera. So one kind of basic way of managing risk is to make sure that you have more than enough in storage, carryover capacity, so to speak. So putting in uh, 14 months worth of corn silage, for example, over years is going to give you not only something to feed out of while you're filling a silo, but also the ability to build up a bank and have that available if you do have a shortfall due to some unforeseen incident. Producing forages, at least in most of the country, is, is pretty unique because we're harvesting during a short period of time in the growing season and we're feeding out of that storage year round. So it's very critical that you can make all the right moves up to that storage process and then lose a lot throughout the rest of the year. An example, um, if you've grown the right crop, had a great growing season, great weather, you timed it perfectly, you got that plant before the NDF became too high a percentage and too undigestible, you put it in at the right moisture, but you didn't do a good job in terms of how well it got packed in that silo. Now you've had all the nutrients, you spent all the money to get those nutrients, and you missed a step in the ensiling process. You didn't pack it well enough. Now oxygen's mixed in with that silage, and it's going to eat up the rapidly available carbohydrate. It's going to allow mold and yeast to become established in the early part of that ensiling process. So when you go to feed it out, it's going to heat up and further reduce the nutrient content of that silage. So we need to make sure that we take the proper procedures, the proper steps in ensiling to preserve all those nutrients that you work so hard to get right up to that point of harvest. Another step in the process that can, can cause problems later is mistakes during harvest. One of, the, one of the factors that's cropped up here recently is that a lot of the, the disc binds and a lot of the equipment that's recently been developed has been developed in order to handle rough conditions. And so some people operate that, uh, a disc bind for example, as a land level or, and as a result we wind up with a lot of dirt in the forage. Well, that dirt in the forage is obviously not digestible, so the ash content rises and the digestibility of the forage goes down. That's one bad aspect of it. The other is that there's bacteria that live in the ground called clostridial, and those bacteria will change the fermentation of that silage and will wind up producing butyric acid even if we have the dry matter correct. So we can do everything right, and if we introduce some dirt in the process, whether it's through mowing or as we're raking the crop, or if we got aggressive pickup heads on our chopper and get too much dirt in that silage, we're going to wind up ruining the digestibility and possibly altering that fermentation to produce harmful volatile fatty acids like butyric acid. Timing is everything. If we don't harvest a crop that's got high NDF digestibility and lower NDF content, in other words, we have poor forage quality right at the time that we harvest it, we can do the rest of the steps correctly. We can keep the dirt out, we can put it up at the right dry matter, we can pack it in the silo correctly, take it out of the silo, but the best you can get is what you start with. And when we start with poor quality, we're gonna wind up with poor quality. We can't make it better in the silo if we don't start out with good stuff up front. So that's why it's important to get the timing right so we have the right NDF digestibility and that we get the moisture right so we at least give the fermentation the chance to produce the right volatile fatty acids that are going to preserve that silage. One of the ways that we can keep on top of problems before they get out of hand is to monitor what's happening in the fields before harvest time. Uh, using scouting services, using extension service, getting out yourself and just walking your fields and knowing what's happening, uh, looking at development. We can catch insect problems early. There's, there's applications that we can make that can correct that problem. If we wait too long, then it's too late. If there's misapplication of pesticides, if we know it early enough, we can do some replants. We can recapture the value that we have there. But we're dealing with a tight window, so we need to be on top of problems early. Scouting your fields, employing services that are going to do that for us are key critical factors for preserving quality. Whether it's a dairy cow or a beef animal, the rumen is really the engine that drives that performance of that animal. So we need to understand how does a rumen function. A rumen, you can think about it as a 50 gallon barrel inside of an animal. In a mature cow, it's a 50, about 50 gallon barrel. 
And in that barrel, you have three types of material. You have on the bottom a liquid, you have in the middle a kind of a fibrous mat, and on the top you have a gas. In a good healthy cow, that's about seven or eight inches of each. So we have good rumen function, we have enough effective fiber, good fiber to form that rumen mat, and that mat functions to capture grain, capture other material, and give time for bacteria to attach to it and break it down. If we don't have that good rumen mat, grain and other material, feed material, will drop right to the bottom and float right out of the rumen. Everything exits the rumen from the bottom out. So that mat is kind of a filter, kind of a holding sponge, if you will, to hold material in there long enough so that it can be digested by the rumen bacteria and my other microbes that exist in the rumen for that purpose. If we have too much forage going in, too much effective fiber, then we don't have that 777 split between gas, mat, and liquid on the bottom. We may have a lot of rumen mat. And the problem there is that it slows the rate of passage. So now we may have plenty of time to digest what's there, but we're not processing enough through that rumen all the time. So this rumen process is always a balance of rate of passage, how much material can we get through it, and, and rate of digestion. How fast can we break apart the forage particles and other feed particles that are coming into the diet? Keeping that rumen healthy is really a function of keeping it at the right pH because the rumen bacteria and other microbes that do all this work have a narrow pH window that they work in. If that rumen pH gets too acidic, then it kills off those bacteria that break down the fiber. So we need to balance that out. When we're doing walkthroughs in herds or we're working with a herd on a consultant basis, one of the key things that we look for is how well the cows are doing, how well they're utilizing the forages that are there. And one of the ways that we do that is that we monitor how many cows are chewing their cud as a percentage. So if we're walking through a pen of cows, we're constantly looking to see how many cows are chewing their cuds. That's one thing. The other thing that we need to look at is kind of the end of the process is the manure. And we have, at Cargo, we have kind of a systematic approach of looking at the manure. Uh, we'll run it through a set of screens, wash out some of the loose material, and look at the fiber that's not digested, the size of the fiber. So we'll have coarse fiber, medium fiber, fine fiber that's not digested or feed material, it doesn't have to be fiber, and wash that away and then we go with the percentages. So we want to see a certain percentage, a low percentage on that top screen of large undigested particles. We want to see maybe a little bit more in the middle screen of undigested particles. But we want to see most of it in that small screen. That means that rumen functioned well, she had the forages to work with to have good rumen function, and there was enough time and enough digestibility that we got good disappearance of the feed that that cow was eating. I'd like to thank Mark Stanton of Stanton Farms for joining us today and sharing with us uh, some of the management decisions he had to make in determining uh, how he's going to construct his new feeding facility and also helping us with, uh, with correct sampling procedure. Today we had a chance to look at forage quality kind of from beginning to end. What risks there are out there in terms of getting a good crop, what timing it takes to get that forage crop put in so we capture the highest amount of nutrients what we need to do in terms of ensiling, so we keep those nutrients that we've worked hard to get already, and what we need to do in terms of measuring that quality so we can maximize uh, the use of it in a ration. And once we do that, we're gonna capture the economic benefit that high quality forage has for us. I'm Kurt Ruppel, dairy specialist, Cargill Animal Nutrition. Thank you for joining us on The Cattle Show. If you have a product or service that you'd like to see featured on a future program, or if you have questions or comments, please contact us.